It's a lot harder if you don't have the ex business experience. Okay. I'm able to relate these guys. Having done over a hundred million dollars in business, yeah, I can go toe to toe with people in the business space and have their respect. If I'm just some random kid asking them questions, it's, the respect isn't there. You know what I mean? So that's, that's I think hard. having a background in business or whatever type of genre your podcast is in is important because mm -hmm. you got to be able to talk with these guys. This is why Joe Rogan does so well. Mm -hmm. He can hold a conversation with anyone for hours for hours. Yeah. So if you're just starting out and you're having all these crazy experts, it's going to be more of a Q&A. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a conversation. And do you feel like there's a big difference between like a Q&A and a conversation? Like, what do you feel like the big, yeah. biggest difference? Most the podcasts two? I'd say are Q&A. Yeah. It's not a real conversation, yeah. authentic conversation. It's not relatable because yeah. the guest is so far removed from, you know, the interviewer. Yeah. And that's so good. Yeah. Welcome to another episode here at the Trailblazers Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Ortega, and we are committed to delivering content that inspires, that motivates, and strategically empowers you as an entrepreneur so you could blaze your own trail to success. And I'm here with somebody you got to pay attention to. I mean, wherever you are, if you're driving, like, Stop the car. If you're at your home office, grab a notepad. Like, you need to be ready to take notes. This gentleman I'm about to introduce to you on this show has disrupted the game of podcasting. I've never seen growth the way he has grown. And I'm telling you, the nuggets and gems and ideas that will be shared here is going to transform your world indefinitely. So be ready to take notes. And with that being said, I want to introduce Sean Kelly. He is the founder of the number one marketing podcast on the in the world. I mean, top top in the charts of Apple and Spotify. He is absolutely killing it. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. What an intro, man. Yeah, man. I'm I'm pumped, bro. Yeah, we're gonna get into it. I'm pumped. <laughs> yo, I, I I've been following you, bro, for maybe two years from a friend. He's like, yo, check out Sean. And Man, I'm just, I'm so proud of you, bro. Thanks, man. You came out swinging. It's what I do. Whenever I enter an industry, I, I don't, I don't hold back, man. It's For something real. I've done since I first started my e-commerce business. Um, within a year or two, I'm in the top one percent of that industry every time. Wow. Even in sports. Wow. It's just a skill I have. When I when I commit something, I go all in. Wow, that's awesome, man. So you, okay? So I just learned. Two new things about you. You played sports yep. and you killed it at Ecom. What would you yep. play in sports? I did everything, man. At basketball, one of the best kids in my town. I did track. Uh, my event was the 800. So that's half a mile. Yeah. I could run that in a minute 59. Wow. So I was really fast in high school. Uh, did soccer, was one of the best on the team. So just like anything, man, just having that discipline doesn't mm. matter if it's physical or mental, something I carry. Where did you learn that from? And like, how did that curate? Uh, it? Yeah, that's deep. I honestly. I don't know. Like I've gone through periods. So my parents got divorced. So I didn't have a father figure. So I had a lot of, um, like I wasn't very confident as a kid. Mm. So I used sports to kind of build confidence. Okay. You know what I mean? Because I was that shy kid that didn't talk to anyone, mm -hmm. but through my athletic abilities, I was able to find friendship and teammates and stuff. Wow. And that sort of gave me some confidence. And then I think I just sort of applied that, mentality into the business world because with running dude you gain a lot of mental strength yeah because you're when you're a distance runner you're running 10 miles a day dang and, and that's so, just, is that like practice or like yeah just, just to practice wow so 10 miles a day only one day a week off and uh dude like you're running at a fast pace like seven eight minutes a mile wow so it's a lot of mental strength and uh some days are freezing because i was in new jersey Oh, so you're not originally from Vegas. No, I'm from New Jersey. So okay. in the winter there, it's like 30, 40 degrees. And you're running 10 miles a day. Yeah, in Dang. a hoodie and like shorts. So you're cold, That's man. That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I'd attribute that, that early stage of my career to really leaving an impact on me. Man, so do you feel like a lot of your drive today has been conditioned from you being as an athlete. Like if you were never an athlete, mm. do you feel like you'll have that same drive as an entrepreneur? Oh, that's tough. Cause like I said, the mental strength that came from running. Yeah. Don't think I would have that. The competitiveness from sports. I don't think I'd have that either. I mean, I was a bit of a gamer, so maybe, but you know, everything you do in the past, you got to use it either as a weapon or a lesson. So yeah. like, that's the way I see it. Yeah, that's so good. A lot of um, successful entrepreneurs that I know, they were an athlete either in college or high school. So do you feel like being an athlete 
sets you up to be a successful entrepreneur? I think it definitely helps. Yeah. I mean, depending on the sport, some would help more than others because there's team sports, there's individual sports. But I think the team sports are good to good to play in, dabble mm-hmm. in a little bit because you learn teamwork, you learn you know how to bond with people, how to talk to different types of people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I played a lot of soccer and basketball growing up, and just learning the dynamics there really helped me out. No, that's so good. I think that's also good for people to hear this because there might be some athletes listening in, like, man, I want to be an entrepreneur, and you said your past you could use as a weapon to to you said two things were those two weapon things or here? lesson weapon or lesson yeah because you so learn about losing bar. you learn about winning i mean i've been on some terrible teams yeah where it can get really depressing we're losing every game you know what i mean yeah and then vice versa i've been on championship teams yeah so you see the you see the culture of both yeah no that's so good man so okay so you you were an athlete and then you got into e-commerce and absolutely killed it what was like that bridge like how did you get into entrepreneurship and what was like that moment where you stepped into it yeah i mean killing it's subjective so my peak year in e-commerce was 1.2 million okay which for some people that's good some people that's nothing but keep in mind i was in i was like a bro college kid starting out so for me that was amazing Mm -hmm. you know achieving a million in a year as a 20 21 year old back this was back five years ago that Mm -hmm. was incredible and it just showed what what was to come but I got into it just going to frat parties in college, seeing every guy wearing a jersey. Mm. And I was like, I know there's a huge market in jerseys. And from there, just sold a bunch of jerseys online using Instagram, using influencers, just figuring it out. I was completely broke, so I would do Mm pre-orders. Just all the guerrilla marketing tactics you could think of. And that was sort of my start in entrepreneurship. Wow, man. I think that's really good for people to hear because you could literally build a successful business with nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. Like all the guerrilla tactics, they still work even till today. Yeah, for sure. Depending on the product, yeah, I, yeah. S- I still see like stuff on TikTok getting millions of views. Yeah, advertising products. Yeah, no, TikTok's a whole different beast. Dope, man. So the jersey brand that you built is it still relevant today? Or are you still like growing it? Still running it, still wearing the jerseys, but I make a lot more of other endeavors, which we'll okay. dive into. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was e-commerce is a good way to I think make six to seven figures. Yeah, getting to eight in e-commerce really hard. Yeah. I'm sure you you were dealing with this. Um, so I pivoted into other ventures where I could have possibilities of making eight to nine figures. Wow. Yeah. And are and all these other ventures are are they in the e-com world or are they outside of it? Yeah. So I think the first time I hit eight figures was PPE. Okay. So that was 2020. A, yeah. That was okay. a mixture of timing and accessibility. Man, PPE. Golly, yeah. bro. That was a, I was, I was tapping into that space too. And I was at the docks of LA, bro. Yeah. Every day. Like, <laughs> gloves are here, but they're not the gloves you need. Uh, you know, all this. Yeah. Those nitro gloves were hard to find. Nitro gloves. Oh my That's, gosh. So many nightmares with nitro gloves. Nitros and 95s sold a, a good amount of gowns actually. Gowns, bro. Um, oh my goodness. Dude, I learned a lot during that period. I mean, B2B had no experience yeah. so that was my first time doing b2b dealing with older people yeah because all the buyers are old yeah, these guys running the hospital the, buyers yeah these guys running the hospitals these guys running the governments they're all old school they don't yeah, text yeah. No. so this was a whole new thing for me i had to learn how to email Dang. i had to learn how to call which is weird to say yeah because I, I wasn't like i was a millennial i was just texting and dming yeah so that was a big change for me yeah that hustle that came out of ppe was crazy man i was grinding yeah. to that for like nine months everyone was every dude. day i mean very few people made it but yeah. if you closed a few deals they were worth seven figures yeah did you close any like big deals in it yeah so i did 17 million in PPE. Dang. um now the profit wasn't anything crazy yeah just yeah. being honest so but like just in terms of gross <laughs> yeah. that was the first year i achieved eight figures in revenue which was a big milestone for me man i i mean i think we did pretty up there too but yeah the 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 profit margins were super thin but you learn a lot you make some great connections um i still talk to some of the people i sold to some of the people i did deals with yeah and that's the thing with business in general you never know when you're gonna need to reignite that connection yeah so it's always good to leave on good terms no that's good man i think that's a bar right there you know especially in fast-paced businesses where you're like you're doing high ticket sales or you're just moving things relationships are they're they're lost because of this the pace but if you're able to condition and massage these relationships like they could be the reason why you get to 10 figures when you're at that position exactly and i'm always nurturing them that's why i love flights because i'll buy the wi-fi and now there's free messaging if you have t-mobile actually on certain airlines but um i'll just text people the whole flight yeah just reigniting uh relationships conversations and by the time i land we're talking big deals yeah you know what i mean so do you feel like 
a superpower you develop over the years has been like the art of communication, like speed and consistency. Yeah. So that's something I learned from my dad indirectly. Okay. Um, cause he, uh, he had dealt with a lot of trauma. So basically he was very reactive. Mm. So as a kid, if I spoke too much, I would get yelled at. So I learned how to listen. I learned how to like be pretty, um, be pretty quiet. And as a kid, you're so active. It's tough controlling those emotions. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to speak up, but that's why I think I'm good at podcasting. I'm really good at listening. Mm. So you've turned what most people could, what, what most people look at as like a disability. Because when you're a kid, I mean, as a father, I'm always like conscious on like how, what's happening in the home. Because I know that certain like, pains could turn in, into wisdom but it could also turn to the weapon formed against right, you right. so do you feel like that like disability that most people could grow up with that turned into like yeah. a tool and there's a balance and yeah. it's tricky like you're saying yeah. it's because some people like my dad got physically abused his whole life yeah. some people can take that and reciprocate that to their children yeah and he chose to go the opposite route but yeah in the household, it gets very tricky because these kids are picking up, especially at young ages. Yeah. So I think z ages zero to six, they learn 90%, their brain is 90% formed, something like yeah. that. I had a guest come on and talk about this. So you really want to leave a good imprint on them at an early age. Yeah, no, that's so good. And it, it's also good to hear like someone like you who has, like you could have went a completely different path. Yeah. But you looked at like that pain and you learned from it. And I feel like so many adults are going through some challenges because they haven't looked at their pain. I was like, how can I learn from this? How could I mm -hmm. use this to my advantage? Like how can I turn this disadvantage to an advantage? Absolutely. Dude, I have on so many guests and they all talk about their traumas. A yeah. lot of people have childhood traumas. They don't address. Yeah. And some people don't address it their whole lives, which is sad because you can live a much better life if you face your demons. That's a fact, man. That's a bar. Yeah. And just talking about your guests and I just want like, kind of shift this podcast like yo this guy right here he runs literally a podcast you're probably listening to you're like oh that's shot <laughs> like bro you came out the door swinging yeah like no one has ever dropped a podcast and in a year you're in like hundreds and hundreds of episodes in yeah and not just with randoms like you got some <laughs> bro you got some heavy hitters yeah we're about to hit 200 in a couple weeks and it's only Dang. been uh first episode released march 13th so we That's turned into crazy. a daily show because i just had so much i still have six months of episodes that i haven't dropped wow so I, I i was like dude this needs to be daily maybe even twice a day yo yeah so i might that be the catalog first. is crazy i might be the first show to do two a day we'll see like how did you how did you do like like if if you could like break down the formula, like what yeah. did you do to be in this position? So firstly, I had a huge advantage given my network. Okay. Just doing great business with people for like five, six years, not fucking anyone over, not scamming, not doing anything, just having a good reputation. So it's way harder to get guests if you just come out of nowhere. You know what I mean? I already yeah, had a yeah. following from yeah, doing yeah. good business, going to conferences. I get a lot of speakers at conferences, um, just going to events and stuff, having my own events. I think you've been to one of mm -hmm. mine, right? Um, so yeah, I host networking events, and uh, so you were doing all of this prior to for years, the podcast. going on other shows, helping people out, making people money. So I was doing that for years, and that's something people don't think about. They just think I, I came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it wasn't like that. Secondly, you got to live in a big city. It's very hard to have a podcast if you're not in Vegas, L.A., New York, Miami a big city because mm -hmm. if you're doing in-person episodes people need to be coming in and out mm -hmm. so vegas it's easy i could get right. 10 15 guests a week every week the whole year because they're here for an event here for a conference or, here for yeah. an event here for a concert here for ufc so many things happen in vegas man so you yeah. never run out of opportunities and then thirdly you need to be really good at interviewing yeah there's so many podcasts right now you can't ask the same questions as everyone yeah. else so i make it very clear to the guests that we're going to talk about stuff they've never talked about yeah and they know that from like the first three questions. And by the time we're finished filming, almost every guest said that was one of the most interesting podcasts they've ever done. Man, that's so dope to hear, man. Because yeah. I see it like from an outside, from an outsider, you know when someone's killing it, mm -hmm. not just like in numbers wise, but the quality of the conversations are there yeah. and it's different every time. So I mean, you, you literally are doing something that so many people are looking up to you, bro. Like, I'm proud of you, man. Like, yeah. And that's great to see that I'm yeah. able to inspire, change people's lives. I have on a lot of doctors that are changing people's health, dude. Wow. Like we're, I'm literally 
causing people to live longer. Like wow. that is crazy. Yeah. And just the output, I'm feeling all this energy. It's insane. All this positive energy and it's coming back to me tenfold. Man, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Like what are the things that you know now that you didn't know when you first started that could have made a bigger difference in the podcasting space, in the podcasting space. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So the clips are very important. People try to cheap out on clips. So I would say people watching this that are interested in starting a podcast, don't cheap out on clips. Those are what go viral. Those You're are talking what, about like reels and stuff. Yeah, like that. Cause you could pay $5 per reel, but it's shit quality. It's someone in India or Pakistan, uh, not to, be like offensive to those countries, but you want, there's a language barrier. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I prefer, I personally prefer having people in the U S do my clips. Cause mm -hmm. there's cultural references that other country people in countries won't understand. Right. So I used to do, uh, I think I used to use a guy in, uh, one of the Asian countries, but decided to pay more. So now I'm paying 20, 25 a clip, mm -hmm. but these clips, some of them get millions of views, dude. Some of them lead to guests. It's just such a high ROI. Wow. So I you mean, don't have like a, like whoever's producing your show is not creating like the reels or you're out. No, so them. I rent a studio out um, just because I don't want to do anything technical. I want to gotcha. focus on what I need to do, which is interviewing. Right. Nothing else to me, I want to divide my attention to. That makes sense. So I outsource everything else. That makes sense. Yeah. I think that's the best way to do it. You have to. Yeah. Because editing, man, is so – it takes too much time. Too much time, too yeah. much effort. Then you're thinking about how to edit the episode when you're filming it. Yeah. What – like, why podcasting? Like, I know you built an insane network and you're around people. Like, when you had the idea of, like, I'm going to create a podcast, what was, like, the foundation to actually commit to it? Yeah, I think there's a few reasons. The first one is just nostalgic because my dad and I, who's no longer here, we used to watch Joe Rogan every day. Wow. So that was, like, one of my favorite memories with him. We would watch full episodes all the time. And I was like, wow, one day I want to have a podcast. Wow. I think secondly is business. Of course, there's there's good money there. You, the networking's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people that are coming on, I would never have access to. And they're coming on because you're able to give them currency and attention. Yeah. Even though some of the people I've had on are billionaires, they would never spend time with me. Now they are because of the podcast. Wow. You know so what I mean? It allows you to be in places. Yeah. Places, opportunities. Yeah. I'm backstage at every business conference now. It's just opened up so many doors. And thirdly, just learning. Mm -hmm. I love learning. Being one on one with someone, undivided attention for an hour, thirty minutes, whatever, however long it is, is insane value, man. Yeah, it is. Yeah, man, you you literally, I mean, you're almost at two hundred episodes in, so you've yeah. gained game. But I've filmed four hundred fifty. Four hundred. So I've learned this year's the most I've learned. I think I've learned more this year than every other year combined. I've been in. Did you have like a budget for like? this whole year or has it like yeah it wasn't set in stone okay. so just so everyone's listening you're not gonna make money the first year probably at least mm -hmm. i lost money i lost 100k the first six months wow so i was like getting a little when worried. you say you lost 100k so you i'm assuming it took 100k studio time and editors yeah i was overpaying for studio time i was okay. paying 500 an hour which was stupid so that was a mistake um editors you know for the full length for the clips Everything just adds up. Travel costs if you're going to film in person somewhere. Um, I think those were the, probably the biggest ones. Did you ever have to pay for any guests to be on your show? No, I'm super strict with that, actually. Because yeah. once you start paying, word will get out. And then guests you would have been able to get on for free will now You'll charge. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll probably never pay unless it, it's someone insanely big, like Trump or something. Yeah. But I'm pretty strict. I don't on think that. even Trump being in charge when the full send guys did the probably podcast. not because they have a huge audience. Yeah, that video got like 20 million views before yeah. it got taken down. That's crazy. I got taken down. Yeah. Have you ever had any like content be taken down or banned or anything? Of I've that had nature? yeah, definitely shadow banned and definitely um, sometimes on the video it says, "Do you want to watch this?" There's misinformation. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I've had a few of those. That's, like on YouTube. On Instagram. Wow. And TikToks definitely removed some. But for me, I'm in a great spot. So here's where a lot of podcasters mess up. Mm -hmm. They rely on views or sponsors for money. Mm -hmm. So when you're relying on views and sponsors for money, you're relying on the platform and the brands to keep the podcast going. Right. You're at someone's mercy. So mm. you don't want to be controlled. You know what I mean? You want to be able to have whatever guest you want to have on. You want to be able to post whatever you want. So for me, I'm not in that spot, which is great. So this doesn't feel like work to me. It's truly passion. That and that I think that's the best place people should get to. 
like because when you do a podcast and you're trying to monetize it from the beginning, mm-hmm. you're gonna do everything wrong. Yeah, honestly, it's too much pressure too. Yeah, I think podcasting when you do at the level you're doing it or the level. I mean, I'm not near the level you're doing it, but we're filming like three, four episodes a week. Right? I have a network and I want to build. And also I feel like there's so many conversations that are had outside the camera that if you were like a fly on the wall, mm-hmm. it would change your, your world. Oh, completely. Yeah. I was thinking about filming those too. Like you guys are doing here. Cause sometimes before we even start, I'm like, dude, save this for the podcast. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's just like those little clips you could add it or just like, it's just, a, it's reels. But like my why for this whole podcast came from like when Clubhouse was popping. Yeah. Now it's so different. Is it dead? I haven't been on there in a while. Bro, I went on today and it's like chats. Oh yeah. It's not even Oh, it's not that, audio? It's, it's it's audio, but it's like walkie talkie. Like you go on the like a uh, chat and you just hear like the walkie talkie conversations of people. Wow. So it's not live. Interesting. Hmm. It's so different. And it's like anyways, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I all I'm saying is like when you're a fly in the wall, a fly in the wall in certain conversations, you get breakthroughs and ideas that you've been searching weeks or months for. For sure. You know, I think more more podcasts need to be out there because there's so much more conversations happening outside of the camera. Yeah, the conversations are crucial. I was listening to Aubrey Marcus, who's someone I look up to. He's actually coming on the show in February. Nice. And he was on Andre Dukum's podcast and he said conversations should be the number one reason you're getting into a podcast. Wow. He said that should be your main priority. And if not, you're in it for the wrong reason. Man, that is a bar. And and I think it just stems from like, know your why. Yeah. Right. Because you came into the podcasting space because you saw value in your network and you saw value in building, you know, relationships by giving them value. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know it would go the route it did. But I originally at first it was these people are insanely smart. They're not getting the eyeballs they want. Let me give them a platform. Yeah. And now it's gone down this crazy route of health, spirit, spirituality, all sorts of different guests. But it's yeah, it's, man, you've had like the whole, the who's who's of who. On yeah, because originally it's just gonna be business entrepreneurs, yeah. but you can only do so much in that space, man. Yeah, you, there's other ways to inspire people. What was the moment when you expanded into other guests that were outside of business? I would say it was Gary Brecker's wife. So her name's Sage Workinger. Shout okay. out to Sage. And this is also how you get big guests. Little side note: work your way up. Mm. Don't email Dana White, uh, like have on people from the UFC, have on some fighters, have them talk highly of you and then ask him, you know what I mean? Mm. So I knew I wouldn't get Gary Brecker off the bat. So I emailed Sage, his wife. It was the first podcast she ever did. Really? So she was super pumped to be on. We killed it, went super viral. Um, that was a big wake up call for me because my health was lacking at the time. Mm. I was getting sick at least once a month. Wow. And I just thought that was normal. You know, I'm 25 years old, getting sick once a month. And ever since I took their gene tests and health tests and started eating the proper diet and, and taking supplements, I've been sick once, dude. Wow. And it's been a year now. That's impressive. Yeah. I got to watch the episode, man. Yeah. Taking a gene test and blood test, man. A super gene test. Yeah. So it's like a swab on yeah. your cheek. Wow. Found out I was allergic to certain things. And, and just cut all out. Cut it all out. That's good, man. Yeah. Like that's, I've never even heard someone take a gene test. Yeah, I think everyone should because you only have to take it once. Yeah. You find out what gene breaks you had. I had two. Most people have at least one. So it's good to know which one you have. So do you feel like you're not even – are you even learning outside of like these interviews or like everything that you're learning as Mm -hmm. a person and as an entrepreneur to keep growing? Do you feel like you get everything you need from these interviews? No, I'm learning daily, dude. I'm, I'm listening to podcasts daily. So I study the top shows. I'm probably listening to at least three episodes a day. Wow. I, I do 2x speed. What uh, um, what shows are you listening to? Diary of a CEO. Oh, that one's good. Yeah. Tom Bill, you quest nutrition, I think. Or impact theory, sorry. Uh, Patrick Bet David. Patrick is really He's gone super political now. Yeah. So I don't listen to that one as much. It used to be more business. Uh, Gary Brecker just launched a new show. I listen to Full Send. I used to do a lot of impulsive. Um, I think it's important to listen to different genres because mm-hmm. it broadens your scope. And I I have on all sorts of guests, so yeah. I need to be well versed in different categories. But yeah, I'd say those those are the main ones. Nice man. So 
being diverse and like the intake you're having from different podcasts, do you feel like that's helping you ask better questions and hold conversations just from a different level? Yeah. Yeah. The questions are super important. So when I have on a guest, I'll watch at least one of their podcasts on someone else's show. Yeah. I'll make sure I don't ask any of the same questions, but also I'll dive in deeper mm. on s their answers on that show and make them explain a bit more. Um, cause podcasts are pretty quick. So sometimes yeah. they don't get the chance to elaborate and, yeah. uh, yeah, dude, like with certain guests, you really got to do research on. Man, how many hours do you put in? Depends guest? on the guest, but I'd say at least 30. So my episodes are shorter. They're 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to do insane. I know some people read their books. Some people go hard. I do about at least 30 minutes per guest. Okay. Yeah. And you feel like that's enough to just yeah. have the conversation? Because it's have. 2x speed, so it's gotcha. technically an hour. But yeah. yeah, so I'd say an hour per guest. Yeah, okay. Man, I mean, you dropped some gems so far, man. I feel like a lot of people listening in has gotten some a taste of, like, what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. So, like, building the network. You said something that you didn't just come out here overnight. Like, you've been relevant in terms of, like, the network you're interviewing. Yeah. So, what do you feel like if someone wants to start a podcast and come out swinging the way you have? Like, what do you feel like they should be doing right now? So, it's a lot harder if you don't have the ex business experience. Okay. I'm able to relate these guys having done over a hundred million dollars in business. Yeah. I can go toe to toe with people in the business space and have their respect. If I'm just some random kid asking them questions, it, the respect isn't there. You know mm. what I mean? So that's, that's I think a having a background in business or whatever type of genre your podcast is in is important because mm. you got to be able to talk with these guys. This is why Joe Rogan does so well. Mm -hmm. He can hold a conversation with anyone for hours, for hours. Yeah. So if you're just, starting out and you're having all these crazy experts it's going to be more of a q a mm -hmm. it's not going to be a conversation and do you feel like there's a big difference between like a q a and a conversation like what do you feel like the big the yeah. biggest difference between most the podcasts two? i'd say are q a yeah it's not a real conversation yeah. authentic conversation it's not relatable yeah because the guest is so far removed from you know the interviewer yeah man that's so good yeah and do you feel like everything that you've done from the day you launched your podcast till now, do you feel like all of that has been successful because you were successful in the space you're in? Like if you were never successful as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. do you feel like you'll have a hard time like producing this podcast? Yeah, I already know, yeah, because I tried doing a podcast five years ago and it failed. Oh, did you? Yeah, so I already know the answer to that and I had no experience five years ago in any business. Wow. And I had no network. I had no value to give people. I was just starting out in business, so I wasn't ready, and that's why I failed. Man, I feel like you you just said something people need to hear, bro. Because there's so many podcasters who go, yeah, you could be successful building up your business and do a podcast, but you kind of said the opposite. Like, mm -hmm. yo, you got to be successful in the space that you want to be being – pretty much hold your podcast in. Yeah. I mean, there are exceptions, granted, okay. but I'm saying in general – People will take you way more serious if they know your name, if they respect your name. Yeah, uh, It's easier to get gas. Everything's just easier. You yeah. know what I mean? So I would say to focus on business first, then do a podcast. I think right. it's way easier to do it If that you're way. trying to do a podcast about the business you're in. But if yeah. you're trying to do like a non-business podcast or whatever, like, do you feel like they should still start that? They should still have knowledge or experience in whatever it is gotcha. the podcast is about. If they're, it's a health podcast, they should have a lot of knowledge there. Whatever genre, I think comedies are popular. They should have a comedian background at least. Yeah. You know? I mean, it makes sense because if you look at the top podcasts, it's always somebody who has relevancy in the space that they're in. It's not some yeah. random person. Yeah. Look at Theo Vaughn. He's one of the top comedians. I think he has the number one comedy podcast. Yeah. All and the Andrew top. Andrew Schultz, I think, has. Yeah. Andrew has Schultz. Too, yeah. All the top health podcasts are from doctors or established names like Huberman. So. So what, what you're saying here then is like, if you're an expert, like, a podcast will just take your authority to the next level. Do you feel like that's like the so like a blueprint to like grow yeah. your authority in your space? It it's the highest ROI on time I've ever seen, dude. Wow. It's not even close and you feel amazing. Like just like everything feels so aligned. Before when I was doing business, money was always number one priority. Right. That's how I thought for seven years. Now with the podcast, it's probably like number three. So what's number one and two? I'd say just like the messaging and like Sometimes I have people on that have no followers mm. and being able to give them a platform feels amazing, dude. Yeah. So that's probably number one and number two, the networking, I'd say, because that leads to number three. The networking yeah. leads to money, but just the connections feels way better than making money. Like 
at the stage I'm in now, at least. Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of money you make, and then, like, what else fulfills you? And relationships, I mean, there's a reason why they say your network is your net worth. Yeah. Like, relationships fulfill every gap that money can't fill. Yeah. I'm at the stage now where made money i could retire so now i'm at the point where i want to do stuff i only enjoy mm. authentically enjoy doing money's not number one it's nice to make money it feels good but for seven years man i gave up my health i gave up relationships for money yeah so so what do you enjoy bro like what is the stuff that you like to do outside of yeah. podcasting? like basketball i'm okay. in two leagues love hooping you hoop here in vegas yeah lifetime okay yeah there's some good leagues there I love learning, so I'm always learning, whether it's audiobook, podcasts. I play a lot of chess. Um, I'm really good at chess. I actually don't know anyone better than me wow. at chess. Andrew um, Tate? I'm just <laughs> actually, he is, but I don't know him personally. Have you thought of like interviewing him on your show? Yeah, so Tristan messaged me. I think we'll set that up soon. Okay. Yeah, I've had on all their boys. I've had on Cooper Sterling, Justin Waller. Uh, I think Satari Shooter's coming on. Um, I want to get the fresh and fit guys on. It's interesting perspectives, you know. That's yeah. that's why I think the show does well too, because I'll have on both sides. Mm -hmm. I won't limit it just to those guys. I'll have on girls, right? Uh, I'll even have on like feminists. I've had on hard Democrats, which I am not a Democrat. So that's something as a host you got to keep in mind too. Mm. Yeah, man. I mean, you've you've built something revolutionary, bro. That's doing well for the culture. Mm -hmm. Like you've created something that isn't just like one directional like certain podcasts you go on for certain things but like yours yeah you could learn so much like it could be the only podcast you listen to it's just like impulsive like impulsive mm -hmm. has like logan paul has all these different people you could literally just listen to that so like was that like your idea with your shows like build something that everybody could learn something different every time yeah i think it be ended up becoming my philosophy but the main thing is i just want people to watch with an open mind mm. and then interpret it however they want to you know what i mean i i as a host i try not to influence too too heavily sometimes it's hard if i really agree with the guest or disagree but I try to be neutral and I try to have the guests speak what's on their mind. Mm. And as, as a viewer, I want them to make educated decisions from there. Yeah, you know what so I mean? Good. Yeah. So bro, what's your, like, what's your why, man? Like what, like when you, like what fuels you to like wake up and just go after it? Because you're pretty much like filming, if not daily, like yeah. every other day, right? Two you're, to three times a week. Yeah. Yeah. You're busy, man. Like what's your why for not just your podcast, but like, because I know you're you're in other ventures too, and you, you earn money from like different things. Yeah, like what fuels you, bro? Yeah, it's no longer money. So if you okay. asked me that four years ago, it would have been just make as much money as possible. Okay, now, it's definitely changed. Now I'd say to inspire and educate is the main purpose, and just getting people's messages out there that are so different from what's taught in the mainstream, mm. and sort of just shift in people's world. Like that to me is cool because at least now they have the information, mm -hmm. and from there they could do what they want. But when I was growing up, all I knew was following the script. Mm -hmm. Go to college, get a job, watch the news. The news made me depressed as a teenager, honestly. Uh, it's never positive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The news channels. So I was just in that system and a lot of people were, man, especially in Jersey. Um, so, yeah, just having access to this information is what I'd say my mission is right now. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. And I think information was... I always tell people this all the time, like if the difference between failing and succeeding in something is the information, mm -hmm. like you could be the most talented person in the world, but if you don't know the right information, you may not be successful at what you're doing. Facts. That's so true, dude. Like it, it real information is currency. It is man. Cause I was working hard as a teenager and in college, but I didn't yeah. have the information to yeah. make more money. And like most people nowadays buy a course or buy something, invest into something to unlock information. Yeah. But what you're doing is you're giving game on through your podcast. Yeah, and I'm getting information too. Yeah. So it's like a win win. You know, I'm helping the viewers, I'm being helped, I'm meeting amazing people. There's so many wins with podcasting, it's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. so good, man. So you're not like you're not one of these like influencers that's killing it and then you have like a course. You're just you're allowing people to grow and learn just from your podcast. Yeah, I never went the course route. Um, it was something I was very strict about because mm -hmm. I saw it destroy a lot of people's reputations. Really? If the course, well, it's tough, dude, because like people buy the course, they expect it to change their lives, right. but you still have to take action. Right. And then if you don't take action, you blame it on the creator of the mm -hmm. course. 
So the course creators get a lot of heat. Like guys like Ty Lopez, all the big course guys got a lot of hate. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I didn't want that. And I chose not to go that route. Instead, I chose to have my own networking events. And they're mm. free. So I'll never charge. They're still free to this day. And I've been wow. doing them for five years. I just love connecting people. Bro, you're you're creating a blueprint for people right now. Mm -hmm. Like the blueprint to like ultimate networking. Yeah, dude. Start having networking events wherever city you live in. I live in the middle of nowhere in Jersey. Yeah. So my first event had like 30 people, but now they have like 500. Yeah. And the and last time you did one in Vegas, that was a lot of people, man. Yeah. 500 people there and quality people now. Yeah. Uh, everyone there is doing a million plus in revenue. I saw Dan Fleshman there too. Dan was there. And yeah. he actually inspired me to have these because he has elevator nights. Right. Which are free. free. Yeah. So now whenever I, like I've, I have about eight to 10 events a year. Wow. Uh, All here in Vegas or just? No, just wherever I go, dude. Wow. I've done every city. Each one has over 300 people. And the opportunities that have come from those, and not only that, but the people that I connect that do business, mm -hmm. now, you know, they're indebted to me. And um, just so much positive energy, dude. I'm big on energy, if you haven't yeah, noticed. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, energy, I think Grant Cardone says, like, wherever energy goes, like, money flows or opportunity flows. Like, energy is everything. Like, if you're around somebody, the energy is bad, you're just yeah. like. You could feel it, man. Yeah. For real. Yeah, you don't even want to talk to them. No, I cut people off that are negative. If I yeah. hear people talking shit about someone, that's a red flag to me. Mm -hmm. I cut those people off real quick because if they're doing that, they're going to do it to you. Yeah. So, like, what's your rule of thumb when it comes to not just networking but building relationships? Number one, like, red flags, you cut them off. Like, what are yeah. there some, policy, like, standards or just, like, what's your what's your rule of thumb when it comes to building really great yeah, relationships? Yeah, I think it comes through repetitions. You're okay. not going to be good right away. I've been scammed. People take advantage of me. But now that I've met thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, I got a good gauge. Mm -hmm. My girl's also very good at reading people. So for those watching, bring your girl to these networking events. Mm. Girls are very, um, you know, sensitive. They can pick up on energies better than guys. Yeah. But um, for me, there's a few red flags. I mean, if they're talking about numbers all the time, that to me is a red flag. Like numerology or something like no, that? No, no. Like if they're bragging about their numbers. Their oh, revenues. like flexing their money yeah. and flexing like that, their views. That shouldn't be the first conversation. You okay. know what I mean? I get it to establish credibility, but some people overdo it. Like, what? what's an example, man? Because I haven't really heard someone flex like that yet. You can tell, dude. If they're flexing numbers and then they're not true, like, you okay. find out they're, like, gassing it, yeah. that's a red flag to me. Got you. Yeah, so that that's more of, like, an insecurity on their end. Mm. But I don't want people lying if I'm going to be in a business relationship with someone. Right. I don't want them lying, even if it's as simple as numbers and revenues. So, like, I mean... A lot of people flex their revenue. It's like, yeah, I did like a hundred, yeah. like whatever type of, how do you verify? Like, do you go down the rabbit hole? Like, let me just verify this. Like, what's your process when it comes yeah, to Yeah, like it's hard to verify because a lot of companies are private. Okay. But you can get a gauge on do it. Do you just feel like from the energy, like, oh, this dude's capping. Right yeah. Now. And I, I do a lot of spiritual stuff. So I have okay. spiritual coaches. So I'm very good at picking up on lies. Yeah. Um, I even had a hypnotist train me to t detect liars. Wow. So you, it's very hard to lie to me now. So the not, hypnotist came from like someone you interviewed and you're like, yeah, no he came from the podcast and same with the spiritual coach. Wow. So that goes back to what we said earlier about just the networking, but, um, you see how they treat other people. That's mm -hmm. a big one for me. So a lot of people that do seven, eight, nine figures think they're hot shit. So like at restaurants, they'll disrespect the servers. Mm. Um, they won't tip valet, simple stuff like that to me is big red flag. Like we'll, we'll distance ourselves from that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, d I can't, I've, seen so many entrepreneurs do that like bro why you, like their social media it's like positive and <laughs> it's like bro like you ain't positive what are you yeah, doing it sucks man like it's I, crazy to me this industry it's like they're all you want them to be how they are in social media and then when you meet them in person yeah. it's like, bro who are you and it happens to me a lot unfortunately because people try to get on my good side mm -hmm. and then i'll see them talk to the guy next to me like shit and i'm like yeah. are you serious dude like treat everyone the same way yeah that's you know, this is something that's not really spoken much in, like, this entrepreneur space. Yeah. Because everybody is afraid. It's like, oh, I don't want to say, like, this person actually like this. I don't want to talk shit. But it's not really talking shit. Mm -hmm. Bro, I looked up – I don't want to say his name, but I looked up to this guy for a long time. And mm -hmm. then I went to his mastermind. I'm like, yo, this dude's super dope. And then we go out to dinner. Same thing. It's like, bro, what are you doing? Yeah. It's and like I, complete opposite. I've been on both sides of it because I've been yeah. to these events when I'm a broke kid just starting out and I see how people treat me. And now yeah. I see how they treat me years later. You know, just try to keep it 100. Um, it's hard, obviously. Yeah. I'm not saying I don't do this, but I, I think I've gotten a lot better. Yeah. I think I'm very cognizant of it. Yeah. 
That's good, man. I think it's really good for people to hear because relationship building is just like be a good person and treat people the way you want to be treated. Yeah. And don't like you don't need to cap. Yeah. No, for real. I put on so many of my Uber drivers, bro. Yeah. I've paid for like consulting on some of them. I've um, hooked them up with podcasts, like connected them with people. I just treat everyone the same. So are you always constantly just like networking wherever you go? Like yeah. Uber or getting food everywhere, or dude. In the, <laughs> in the sauna at Lifetime, I've met some great people. Um, dude, Lifetime. everywhere. How's that? Like which uh, which location do you Henderson. go? Henderson. Is that one pretty good? Dude, fire. I've yeah. met some great people. I've met some podcast guests there. I've met like people in my basketball league that I'm doing business with. Man, I got a membership there. Yeah, because it's think about it. It's 250 a month, which is a lot for a gym. Yeah. So only the best of the best are going to go there. So there's certain things I don't mind paying for because I know there's an ROI there. Mm. So like for masterminds, some of them are like 25, 50K a year. Right. I'll pay because I'll meet one person and do 5, 10X that. Yeah, I saw you comment on my post of that mastermind you just joined. Is yeah. that one pretty Jim good? Jim Dews. Yeah. Uh, I didn't start yet, but yeah, I just joined. And then I was in Dan's mastermind before. Okay. Dan yeah. Fleshman? Yeah. How was his? Fire, dude. Yeah. 100 grand a year. Best the, invest- Is that the 100 million mastermind? Yeah. Best, one, best investment I made other than the podcast. Dang. Yeah. What are your like top three things you've you've received out of that mastermind? Friendships. I still talk. The mastermind was five years ago. I'm best friends with uh, one person I met there. Wow. Um, money. I've ended up making tens of millions from it from the people I met there. Mm-hmm. And I guess just just the networking, dude. Because there was a hundred people there, and all of them are doing you know five, ten mil plus a year. So wow. just being around that from from being in Jersey where there's no entrepreneurs, I was top dog where I where I lived. Getting humbled and being around that elevated me. So I'm always trying to put myself around. Now I'm at the stage where I want to be around nine figure guys and billionaires because mm-hmm. um, I'm doing like anywhere from fifty to hundred million a year now. So I want to be around guys that are doing better than me. Wow, like. How did you get to doing a hundred million a year? Like it's only been five years. Yeah, I think I haven't hit a hundred yet. Is this through set your jer- is it through your jersey company or is it through other ventures? It's through everything. Okay. So everything combined. But last year I think probably around eighty mil. Wow. And this year, depending on how this month goes, we might crack a hundred. Wow. Because the past thirty days, uh, we've done a lot of volume. What and is that's, it that you're, if you don't mind me asking, man, like, what is it that you're doing? Yeah, so it's it's affiliate offers, okay, but really good offers. So have you heard of ERC? Yeah, ERC. yeah. So that was the one last year, but this year it's SETC. Okay. So that one's moving significant volume. What is that? It's the same thing as ERC, but self-employed tax credit. Wow. So it's entrepreneurs, people with under five employees. Wow. They get a refund. So just putting people like that with accounting firms that can help them get their money back. Wow. Yeah. So 80 million doing that? Yeah. So this month, depending on how it goes, we might finish the year off at 100 million. Dang. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Most people don't even get to that number. No. And it's all like who you surround yourself with, finding the great offer, because there's very few offers you could do eight, nine figures with. Right. So you have to first find those. And that comes through networking, meeting people, talking to them, what they're doing. And that's a big part of it, man. Because if you surround yourself with people doing worse than you, you're never going to get better, unfortunately. that is a bar. And it's tough because they're your friends, obviously. Yeah. But you have to make that choice. Do I want to stay friends with these people and give them most of my time? Or do I want to level up? Man, I think that's what most people need to hear right now. Yeah. Like, literally, it's something that's been said in entrepreneurship forever. It's like your network the five people you surround yourself with, you're the sixth. Yeah. And so making that decision of like, I'm going to spend my time with billionaires. What did you do? Like when you made that mental commitment, like what was the follow up from that? Yeah. So I saw this on Tom Billy's podcast. He said, billionaires love being around young energy and giving them advice to see if um, it works. So I thought that was interesting. And I think literally the next week I was at a conference where Tucker Carlson spoke and RFK Jr. And there was two billionaires there and they, they um, liked being around me, had them mm-hmm. both on the podcast and now they're mentoring me. Wow. So I'm literally being mentored by billionaires. I've had I think three or four billionaires on the podcast now and we're at the point now where I could just text them for help. Wow. 
and like these guys are worth over a billion dollars dude bro that's a whole different world when yeah. you have access to people like that it comes with sacrifice so now i'm at the stage where i really value family because mm-hmm. that's something i gave up for five to seven years wow because you have kids or no, no i kids? want kids though okay. but when i was working so hard seven days a week no vacations for five years wow i gave up family and friends yeah so now i'm at a point now where that's shifting a bit so I don't think I want to become a billionaire yet, at least. But eight to nine figures is a comfy, comfortable range for me. I think you said something so important, man, because I could relate to that completely. I've I've grinded hard from like 18 to 22, uh, exited a company for seven figures at 22 and had my first kid at 22. And like that perspective difference, mm-hmm. like I would much rather be broke with family I mean, I don't want to be broke with family. I don't want to speak that to existence, but like, yeah. I much rather have family than money. Ooh. Now, where I'm at, like, I, but but obviously, money is a part of the journey. Yeah. But I would much rather be happy with my family than be miserable grinding, chasing money. Yeah, it's tough, man. As you develop through the entrepreneurial journey, I feel like it shifts, right? Right. As you get that bag, it it slowly gets lower. I'd say families. 60 percent for me money is okay. 40 right now okay. but i could see when i have kids that goes up to maybe 70 80 it definitely goes up man priorities just i mean if you're the right person there's some people with kids that value their banker more than they value their kids yeah i don't see myself doing that because i think having kids is one of the most beautiful things in life yeah. and congratulations i saw you proposed like last year right yeah a few months ago i think oh, a yeah. few months ago okay yeah. so getting married in two years they were fully booked next year man Really? Yeah, these venues are printing money. That's a whole nother podcast. I'm going to have on a wedding venue because, dude, they're making 15, 20 mil a year. 15 mil a venue? Yeah. They were fully booked next year. Here in Vegas? No, in Jersey. Jersey, But we saw two of them. They were both booked out next year, dude. Dang. 15 to 20 mil a year. That's wild. I would never think an event space could do that. Exactly. And no one, I haven't seen a podcast at least of like a wedding venue person explain the model. I think it'd be interesting because it doesn't seem that hard to start like location and maybe a huge investment to set it up but yeah. like there's no like real operational cost no. like, you don't have a whole huge staff maintenance. and the like, skill set's not that tough like no. i'm sure if you work it sells itself yeah i'm sure if yeah. you worked at a wedding venue for a few months you could learn everything you needed to dang that's crazy so it's an interesting model to me and i feel like um everyone like marriages will never end yeah. people are always going to get married i mean it makes sense like i'm like i I got married legally this year, but we're doing our wedding next year. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell? Like, we, we're we budgeting, like, six figures for a day. I'm like, that's, that's crazy that's to happened me. to us. Yeah, we spend 100K. That's wild. And that's normal. Yeah. In certain venues, at least. But, yeah. So, it makes sense. If, if they're doing, like, a wedding, like, five days out of seven days, that's 500K, 500K a, a week. week. Times four is two mil. Two mil. Time. Oh, well, winter's slow. Yeah. But yeah, 15 to 20 mil. That's wild, man. Yeah. Are you doing out here? Yeah, we're doing out here. How much? Uh, and they were 100K out here? For everything. I'm talking okay. like the 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 venue, the entertainment. Yeah. Uh, the How many people? I think it was like 400 people. Oh, shit. You're having a big it's ass. A big, bro, bro, I'm like. Mine was 175. Yeah, just our family, like not friends, is already over 100 people. Dude, you got a big family. <laughs> Yeah, my it's it's like, cause my girls' sisters they all have like four kids each. So it's like wow, a lot of kids. Yeah. We're having a child-free wedding, so yeah. It, I, I'm assuming if we had childs, there would be 300 ish. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's why my number's so big is right. because we are letting our friends and family bring kids. Yeah, I didn't want the stress. I love yeah. kids. Don't get yeah, me wrong, yeah, but yeah. on a wedding, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's a lot, man. Cause then you gotta like. We have to budget for like childcare and yeah. all that stuff. You gotta it's get like, nannies. Dang. Yeah, yeah it, it's really it's just a lot, man. I wouldn't if I could go back before we committed. I would make it child free for yeah, sure. I feel that. That's how I feel on just traveling in general. Yeah. At the moment for Tra- like traveling. Cru- no, like you know cruises. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I've been yeah. on one without kids and with kids. Yeah. And I know you have kids, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful. No, it's hard, bro. <laughs> like we went to Hawaii recently and just like. Traveling with a four, two, and a ten month year old, ten month is crazy. It kind of takes the because it's more of like a necessity. You got to take care of them. Yeah. So when you when you're traveling, you're trying to chill. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't you can't network. You can't do anything. Yeah. Like I was in the plane. I'm like, dude, I think this person is somebody. But my daughter's crying. Ah. I'm just that person. Like, yo, like, why? 
Like, I know when I'm in the plane and I hear kids cry, I'm just kind of, like, shutting that eye yeah. well. I don't even want to pay attention to it. Planes are good spots to network, which pe- I don't see people do often. Yeah. I, uh, I always network on the plane. Do you, like, for me, I always f- – ha- if I could – if, if the plane has first class, yeah. I always do it yeah. just because, like, the networking aspect. Do you do the same thing? If it's not obnoxious, pro- like, sometimes the first class is, like, way too much. Yeah. But if it's reasonable, yeah. Like, I yeah. just went to Atlanta, and it was, like, 500 extra. So I was like, why not? I think domestic first class – I mean, it's not even first class. It's just – I don't think they call it first class. It's just a priority seating, right? On certain airlines, yeah. yeah. I know some of first class, but it's not even like the seats aren't that much different. Yeah, it's not much. Like yeah. I went to Miami first class and it was like four hundred bucks yeah. for the flight. Wow. That's yeah. it. That's it. Damn. What airline was that? Um It wasn't Spirit. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Frontier. Think... Southwest. Okay. Yeah. It was one think... of the ones with the S. I was like, hold on, yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't Spirit. I don't think Spirit even has first class. No, Spirit is not first class. <laughs> I've bro. never flown Spirit. Spirit is wild. I don't think I would. It's crazy. I don't think I would do it. I wouldn't suggest it. Bro. Yeah, I've heard some nightmares. It's crazy. Like the last time I I flew Spirit to San Diego because that's quick. It's only it, I think you could only fly Spirit to San Diego honestly. Yeah. Because the other d- flights you got to like go to L.A. or there's like layovers oh, direct layover. to Spirit. And when I was in Spirit, it, it was obnoxious, dude. Yeah. My friend flew Spirit from Jersey to here, and he said there was a fight. There was someone threw up everywhere. <laughs> yeah, there's always something, man. Either, like, the people that fly – not to talk – look, yo, like, if you fly Spirit, bro, like, <laughs> it's cool. I'm just saying, like, every time I fly Spirit, I feel like I'm going to have an anxiety attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the turbulence. It's just not a good combination. Yeah, there's, like, a meme on TikTok where – it was like a, a twerking song. Yeah. It was like a girl about a twerk, and then it goes into the spirit plane. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm good on spirit. Yeah, man. Just do, lots. You, do you ever fly um, JSX? Yeah, I'm flying there next week to San Diego. I love JSX. Yeah, I didn't even know about it until I um, – it's funny. I was flying spirit to San Diego, and then, yeah. like, they delayed, d- delayed my flight. And it was like – instead of 9, it was midnight. I was like, bro, I ain't going to – fly at midnight yeah so i go on uh google flights i go like vegas uh, or san diego to vegas and it was through jet blue i'm like all right cool whatever yeah. 250 bucks didn't know it was jsx i'm at the san diego airport and then it's like oh you gotta go outside the airport i'm like this is crazy <laughs> i had no idea what, what i was about to get into yeah, go dude. to the jsx terminal i'm like bro this is this is private yeah Dude, it's like for real private. It's private, no security. They don't even search your bags at some no, of them. It's like a little like table. Yeah, the networking's amazing on those. Yeah. I try to talk to as many people as I can when I fly JSX. Uh, I actually know the owner. He's coming on the podcast. Really? Of yeah. JSX. And my friend David, who's a GM at Nomad Hotel here, he's the their biggest customer. Wow. Because he lives in LA, but he works in Vegas. So he's on there three times a week. That's crazy. Yeah. JSX, for those who don't know what JSX is, let me let me have Sean give you the experience, like, what is it flying? What's your experience flying JSX? Yeah, so it's it, it's semi-private. I wouldn't consider it private because there's okay. other people on the plane. Okay. I think they fit, like, what is it, 40 to 60 people on average. Yeah. Um, you could fly with your dogs. You could fly with uh, stuff you normally wouldn't be able to bring, I guess. They don't search. Um, it's probably double to triple the price of commercial. But I'd say if you're on a time crunch, it's worth it because you save a couple hours. You could show up 20 minutes before your flight. Yeah. I've done that. You could that. show up as they're boarding yeah. the flight. Yeah. And they give like free food and free snacks, snacks. free drinks. Yeah, all that. Yeah. And you're with some good people. I was with um, like crazy ass like business CEOs last flight. Yeah. That you just randomly met. Yeah. I mean, if you're on there, you're you're making good money most most likely. So Yeah. Man, that's that that's a hack, man. Because although it's like three to four x, it's still a few hundred bucks. It's not anything crazy. It's nothing crazy. And if you if you value your time, mm-hmm. you got to do the math. Oh, I'm saving two hours. What is an hour worth to me? Yeah, no, that's that's true. Because term like going through traditional airports is crazy, man. It's like, not a good even experience. Even if you have like TSA approved and clear and everything, like there's still lines. It's still crazy. Yeah, you're, you're still, still waiting. You're still waiting at least an hour. I'd say. Yeah, and between. Uh, those delays are wild. Yeah, delays and the boarding takes like 30 minutes. Yeah, like so. you could board first class, but you're still waiting 30 minutes in the plane, man. Yeah. Like JSX, that's how I flew it. Like we boarded in like 10 minutes, we're in the Exactly. Air. Yeah, I've taken it to Denver, dude. Like it goes actually pretty far now. Oh, does it? Yeah, Vegas has a lot of flights. 
a lot of routes. How far does J? Can you go to like Atlanta, JSX? Nah, you could go to Texas and Denver, but they have routes on the East Coast if you're there. Okay, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah, because I'm, I'm definitely planning some East Coast stuff. Man, that's that's dope, bro. So you're are you constantly traveling, like doing podcasting, or do you mainly film? what you're doing here in vegas mainly here if it's a bigger guest um i'll do it sometimes i'll go to la la or miami i'll probably go to twice a year to podcast okay. each because there's a lot of good guests in those cities but i try to keep it all in vegas and it's really not that hard if you're here yeah who's your uh i meant to ask this earlier but yeah. like who's like the best guest you've had like since you've started doing this it'll probably be someone you never heard of his name's mateus de stefano Okay, yeah, never heard of him. Yeah, but he just opened my world. I mean, this guy remembers all his past lives. What? <laughs> yes. So that, first of all, opened the door for me to explore mine. Mm. And then it explore made me explore spirituality as a whole. Never oh, really? Even, yeah, I would have never knew about Billy if I didn't have Mateus on and explore spiritual guests. Um, Billy is one smart mf -er, bro. Yeah. Like, holy crap. That mind needs to be protected at all costs. That I mean, just listening to the episode, I'm like, yo, this is. I, I hear him on TikTok and all, but like that episode yeah. was fire. He's gonna change the world. Him and Mateus. There's a few people that I've had on that I and they're all uniting right now. But right. there's like a really, really big spiritual uprising right now, awakening, and these guys are all gonna change the world. Wow. Yeah. And why do you like? Why do you say that? You can just see their messaging is so against the programming that has gone on. For our whole lives and for the lives before us that they're really gonna impact like i don't know if news channels are gonna last dude mm. like before we pass away they might not even be relevant because people are waking up and seeing that there's some hidden agendas and programming going on yeah and do you feel like like not to bring his name up again but like andrew tate kind of went down that rabbit hole to like break the matrix yeah like do you feel like what these elite people did to andrew they may do to someone like billy or do you feel like it's different because he doesn't yeah i mean if it's it's tough to say if, it, if that's what they're planning it's going to be hard to stop but i think the fact that he's already inspired tens of millions um is so powerful that there's just this movement they won't be able to stop everyone yeah you know what i mean yeah so billy's a brave person for stepping out there and i have a lot of respect for him yeah and he says some stuff that you'd never Imagine. Yeah, I mean, he spoke Makes up sense. on the wildfires, he spoke yeah. up on, like, um, immortality, all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Man, that's that's really cool that you're able to have these type of guests. And, and then you have, like, the billionaires, and you have, like... Yeah. Like, even you have, like, other celebrities come on. Like, how do you manage, like, the communication and just, like, the flow of getting all these guests? Like, do you have, like, a... Like an appointment setter or like yeah. how do you how do you flow with all this? Yeah, I have like a VA slash appointment setter. Okay. But I, I wouldn't recommend that at first. At first you want to do it. Right. So I did that for months and learned the process. Then I outsourced it so I could focus on interviewing. Yeah. But the best way is cold emails. And if you have a following on any platform, cold DM, I'd say. Yeah. Those two methods. And then going to conferences and events. I'm going to a uh I just found out about this, I forget what it's called. It's like haunted expo haunted expo yeah it's at an asylum in in pa an asylum yeah so it's a bunch what? of people that investigate hauntings ghosts abnormal stuff so i'm going to that just to look for guests oh sorry i don't mean to laugh at it that's just yeah. like you don't hear somebody like i'm going to an asylum for, <laughs> for a, a, a expo that's crazy yeah i wish i remember the name dude so but... it's the industry of these guys who do this i'm assuming that's what this yeah is. there's a bunch of paranormal shows they investigate ghosts they investigate hauntings possessions wow. all this crazy stuff um but yeah i'm literally flying to pa just to go to that find five to ten guests and then fly home dang so you're really diversifying bro like who you're bringing on to the show yeah and vegas makes it easy because there's conferences here so i'll yeah. go to a conference at least once a month here and just get five to ten i got I just flew to uh, Atlanta last week. Yeah. I got like 12 guests there wow. at a conference. So like people aren't going to in-person events. I think that's a mistake. Are you constantly like, do you intentionally go to these events because like you're going to pull guests from or does it naturally happen? Uh, I mean, it's not like my main goal to do that, but it, it kind of happens when I bring up the show and if yeah. they're interested in coming on, we'll just schedule a date. You yeah. Know? That makes sense. Yeah. Because everybody, everybody, I think, 
today wants to be talking on, on some sort of platform, whether it's a podcast or a stage or whatever. Mm. Like everybody wants that limelight. I mean, it can, the eyeballs, if you're able to monetize them, there's certain guests that have come on and making a ton of money. Yeah. Um, so the results are there, man. If you get on a big show like Rogan or Andrew Huberman, it could change your business overnight. Yeah. And do you feel like your business generally has been completely disrupted since this podcast yeah i mean just the credibility factor now i could shoot out a text to just about anyone i'm i'm one degree away from anyone in the u.s right now that's crazy, i'm talking elon bro. musk i'm talking trump i'm talking mark cuban i'm one degree away i'm having on shaquille o'neal's son tomorrow i'm one degree away from Shaq. Dang. like that's where i'm out Shaq's right son's the dj right sharif is i'm not sure i know he's a hooper because my boy uh he's i gotta get you connected with him he, his name is Dennis. He's the uh, Slam has a podcast yeah. called League Biz, where they talk about like the business of basketball. He oh, hosts cool. that podcast. Nice. And we were at the um, Slam Slam launch ball. party. Yeah. At the win, where Shaq was DJing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and then before Shaq DJed, his son was DJing. I had no oh, idea. I was like, yeah, "That's Shaq's son." I'll ask him about it tomorrow. Yeah. It was Sharif or Shakir. I don't know the name. Was he super tall? Bro, I was really drunk that <laughs> night. <laughs> so you're still I drinking a know. lot. I don't drink. Like I, I have a rule. My rule is this: I will only drink if it has to be something worth celebrating. Okay, fair. I and like we that. We were celebrating like my boy having a successful season with Slam, and it was Slam's launch party, yeah. and so it was worth celebrating. Yeah, Everybody's yeah. like, "Cheer!" Like I'm not gonna drink. If it's just, hey, we're going out, or if it's a regular event, like if it's not yeah. worth celebrating, because I'm taking a risk. I'm harming my health. Yeah. I'm, you know, it's just, it, I'm taking a risk on my health, and I would do that if it's going to be a celebration. I like that. I like that. That's that's a really good rule, actually. Yeah. I, I, cut, that, it, bro, yeah, I, I cut it pretty much completely. Really? In terms of getting drunk. Okay. I'll have a wine or whatever. Well, like I got to be honest. I got to say something here. I'm lightweight, bro. I can, have, <laughs> I can have one drink, and I'm just like, yo, I'm feeling it. Do you have the Asian flush? I do, man. Yeah, I, I get, get red, bro. That It has its good and bad. The good part is it's cheap to get drunk. Yeah. Because, bro, I have one Patron shot, and that's it. That's I'm, it? I'm good, man. Damn. I, I'm good for like three hours. I used to be able to take like 20 shots 20 in my prime. Shots. I used to be a partier, bro. Dang. Yeah, it was bad. That's I won life at the party in high school. Really? Yeah, just – being super insecure about myself, just drinking nonstop. Dang, man. Yeah, and they reward that in high school. That is the disadvantage of our society, man, is they yeah. reward all these stupid Degeneracy, things. Degeneracy, yeah, gambling, drinking, smoking. All that dumb stuff. Yeah. But So you've been sober for how long now? I wouldn't say so. I mean, so I've only been drunk probably once in the past four years. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's... That's impressive, man, because yeah. someone at, even at your caliber doing the things and being in certain rooms, people are drinking at most of these events. A lot of – even crazy. my events, yeah. Some people are blacking out at my events. But, yeah, it was a phase of mine that I'm glad I got over quick. That's good, man. And now that I'm having all, all these doctors on the show talking about how terrible it is for you, yeah, it actually causes permanent brain damage. Wow. Alcohol. That you can't you can't grow those cells back. So I, I stopped completely. I mean, I see. I, I have friends who – have been drinking since 21. I'm 28. I'm turning 29. So yeah. like eight years of just drinking, I can see it. Like, bro, you don't, yeah. you do not look the same. Man. Yeah, dude, you, it adds up. You can see it on people. Man, I think that's a, that's a bar that, that's a hidden bar for this <laughs> podcast, bro. If you, if you drink it, you got to stop that. I mean, to each their own, it's yeah. your health, your body. But for me, I'm good. It's yeah. not worth it for me. Yeah. That's so good, man. What a, like we're getting to the tail end of this podcast, but I just want to ask you, man, like, what do you do daily to sustain this level of growth? Like what are some like regimens or mm -hmm. routines that practices that you do every day to sustain the growth that you're constantly having? So I would say message people daily, okay. set a goal for me. It's a hundred a day, whether it's messaging or email. Um, but I'm actually emailing more than that now. Uh, but messaging 100 a day for me on 100 DMs. 100 people, like random messages? or like No, just like people I'm trying to get on the show, okay. people I'm trying to work with, whatever it is you're trying to do, okay. message. Um, it, I used to do it until I was blocked for years on Instagram. Wow. Yeah. So I probably messaged over a million people at this point. Dang. Yeah, because just over the years. And then email, I email 300 a day. Wow. Yeah. So set goals for DM messaging. The compound effect. Hormozy talks about this on 100 million leads. 
you're not messaging enough people right now. Mm. So that's just the cold hard truth. P- some people aren't messaging anyone at all. Yeah. They think people are just going to come to them, which is Yeah, they're just like literally waiting at their door waiting yeah. for it to be knocked. It ain't going to happen. Nah, you got to take action. And then on the health side, I do sauna three times a week, cardio twice a week, basketball leagues. I ground every day. Mm. So my bare feet are in the grass every day. I feel amazing, dude. Absolutely. It's hard to do that in Vegas. I have grass in my backyard, luckily. Yeah, you but blessed, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. You know you blessed when you got real grass in your backyard <laughs> in Vegas, yeah. bro. But dirt's actually better than grass. Really? So whatever you have is fine. Okay. Uh, get some sunlight as soon as you get up. That starts your circadian rhythm. And then Wim Hof every day. Have you oh, heard is that about? the breathing technique? Yeah. You'll feel amazing. Completely got rid of any anxieties I ever had. Okay. I need to revisit that. Yeah. I do that every single morning. Um, what else do I do a lot? And learn. Learn every single day. Okay. I mean, obviously, someone like you, you're learning through podcasting. You're always studying. Yeah. But like, outside, do you, I mean, do you feel like podcasting is the best way to learn? For me, I like it because I'm a podcaster, so okay. I'm learning. So it's kind of biased, but then. A- yeah. I'm not just learning what they're saying. I'm learning right. communication styles. I'm learning posture. Right. I'm learning types of questions to ask. But yeah, learn whatever you're trying to make money off of. You know what I mean? If you're trying to be a scientist, watch scientific podcasts or whatever. Like, it's different for every industry. Yeah. No, that's so good, man. Well, bro, I know uh, we're on time right now. We have like. A little bit of time left, but I appreciate this, man. Yeah. Like, I appreciate this conversation and just the different angles we've had. And, um, look, if you've been watching this podcast, you're tuning in and you still haven't tapped in with Sean Kelly, you still haven't heard of the Digital Social Hour, yeah, yo, you got to tap in because this man has dropped some gems here. But I just want to say, like, I've been listening to his podcast for quite some time and it's one of my go to. So I, I want to encourage everyone that's listening, watching this tap in with sean he is killing it and if you want to be a guest of his i'm sure he has a way to do that as well through his you have like a link for for people to tap yeah in with you? there's a link or just message me and okay. uh, we'll send you a link okay and is there any like exciting stuff you have going on for the rest of the year that you want to talk about i don't know when this is coming out but there's some really big guests coming up okay. uh next year don't be surprised if this show is like one of the biggest in the world man i i feel it is man i mean it's already one of the biggest in the world. Like, you're like about to get like take a quantum leap yeah i think so man i'm pumped for you bro well, i appreciate you being on the show um i just want to just give you my gratitude for your time man i know you're a busy person and mm-hmm. um just, thanks for coming on yeah man. thanks for having me man yes, sir. It. all right guys well today was dope like this whole conversation was super dope i'm very full um, I just want to say like, yo, if this podcast has impacted you, if you've been tapping in with us for this first season, or if you haven't tapped in with us, like subscribe, like comment, if you're on Spotify, iTunes, yo, drop a review. Um, it helps us grow this podcast and we'll see you in the next episode.